morning, good afternoon, good night. This is Marfa's dream. This has become a podcast. How do you become anything you dream, you declare, you commit, and success is your next breath. So, got in late last night. I've been really busy and really difficult to uh, prepare like I would like to uh, for, the, for, for the podcast. Um, and I often try to spend the night before uh, thinking, thoughts, coming up with three points of uh, three points of contact, coming up with a theme, coming up with stories, narratives, and so on and so forth. Even doing a little bit of research, uh, all depending on what the topic is. And uh, just because I'm always getting in late and I want to get up early to get my day going, it's like I got to compromise. Do I stay up later and then make it difficult for me to get up in the morning or... Do I go to bed and make so I can get up in the morning, or you know, just always kind of compromising myself in some ways? But um, I woke up this morning and all of a sudden uh, I wasn't going to do a podcast, but then I thought of a topic, and then like not only did I think of the topic, just so many thoughts came into my my brain at one time. So I said I got to go downstairs and record. So what I want to talk about is. Uh, uh, I'm going to give you a, a AAU basketball rant, all right? And I, and hopefully, I can say some things that haven't been said or, you know, create a narrative or an argument um, that that is compelling enough, that, that is compelling to, to, to really think about. And so, um, what I wanted to name this podcast is AAU Sucks, but it doesn't suck. It, it does a lot for kids. It gives kids a lot of opportunities. It gives kids some incentive to do well in school, to be physically active. It gives kids a lot of incentives. But I do believe that the way that the, the AU is constructed in America, it, it it's not only impacting, it's 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 not providing the product that it's capable of for young kids. And I think that we're starting to see it in the NBA. We're starting to see it in the NBA. And there's some parts of the NBA that are really, really good. But I think there's a sneaky little secret. Um, there's a sneaky little secret in, in that bat, AAU basketball is impacting the game. So the, the, the way that the game is played in terms of um, the spacing, in terms of the pace, in terms of the elevate the, the, uh, the evolution of the three ball, um, it's a cooler game. It is more spacious. It provides, a, it, it provides the consumer a lot more opportunity to see uh, players play in space. You know, the, the reason why Kyrie Irving came in at an awesome time, because if he played in the 90s, um, and maybe even in the 2000s, he may not have that space. Kyrie Irving might like a, may look a lot different, all right? But because he has so much space, we're able to see this 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 6'1", 6'2", point guard, you know, skip to the lane, and you're able to see him do all these acrobatic layups because he's only going against one guy, right? Sometimes maybe two, but most times he's just going against one guy. And because the spacing is so, so the, the spacing is, is as it is, the help side guy has to come from such a far way to go over and help that in, in, in corner guys who hit corner threes or guys who hit threes in the corner are so lethal, you're saying, can this guy guard this guy on his own going to the basket one-on-one or do I need to come help? Because if I help, these guys are good enough to get rid of that basketball, get it to the corner and either get a shot in the corner or skip it. And, or, or a pass it and get a wide open shot or another or another attack. So the way the game is played is awesome, and, and we're seeing some of the these creative guards and playmakers uh, play in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment where they have a lot of space. But but we're starting to see that the big fella isn't as good as he used to be. We're starting to see that the two guard has been changed a little bit. The three-man has been changed a little bit, and the four-man is becoming somewhat irrelevant. Now your three is becoming a four, especially as he gets older in age and, and it gets a little bit stronger. We're starting to see that you got guys that, like Paul Pierce, who played the two and the three the bulk of his career, he was able to play the four toward the end of his career. At six, seven, he was able to play the four because we are realizing that, you know, again, some, some, some parts of the game, some positions of the game have been kind of vamped out and, 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 and evolved. And so... Here's just my basketball rant. Back in the day when you had AU basketball, you had fewer teams. You had fewer teams. You had fewer, you had fewer games. Okay? You had more practices. You had better coaches, better development. And you had to, you had a, overall, you had a better product. Okay? Let me talk about back in the day. Fewer teams. 
So a lot of AU basketball, you might have been somehow your basketball situation, your AU basketball might have been somehow connected with your high school, right? Or maybe you had and there was an AU program that was separate from the high school, but it's still you still had to make that team. You still had to make that team, and you still had to. Um, uh, it still was like an exclusive club. It was almost like making your high school team, right? So if you made AAU, you know, it was still a privilege to play on the team, and you still had to make that team. And if you didn't make that team, that means you had to do one or two things. Either you had to give it up and realize that maybe you ain't really about that, that you know, ball, ain't, ball isn't life for you, or you had to go back in the lab and you had to work your butt off so that you could make that team. But what you couldn't do is just go to another team and go to another team and go to another team and eventually pay to play. So back in the day, man, you had to earn your stripes. And you had, and, and, and making an AAU basketball team was just as hard as making your high school basketball team. There's only a few spots. Didn't have a, a A team, a B team, an elite team, a select team, a travel team, a development. They didn't have all that for just one age group. You had one group of guys, and those, and, and you, and those are the guys you're going to play with. I don't know if guys jumped around as much. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, you had one team. You had, you had, you had there's a few options. You had to make the team. And you're going to be part of, uh, let's say, a 13 to 15-man roster. You had fewer games. You had fewer games. There wasn't tournaments every single weekend. You played locally. You played locally. You might travel a little bit. You know what I'm saying? So maybe if we in, if we in, if we in Detroit, we may go to Lansing and play. Maybe we may go to Ohio and play. You know what I'm saying? We may we may travel to Indiana and play, but it still was you still want to see how you how you fare against the people in your area in your in in, in, the, in the immediate area, right? So in your state, how do you get? How do you fare? How do you compete against those people? So let's say instead of going out of state, you might be doing a lot of you know we're going from Detroit, we're going to Flint and play, we're going to go to Lansing and play. You know, maybe there might be something up in Muskegon or something like that. Grand Rapids. We're going to go over there and play and see how, how, and see how good we are. Saginaw. We're going to go over there and see how good we are. So there's fewer games, less travel, right? And it, was a, and it was a localized thing. And then maybe once you can start getting the regionals and, and, and you start, once you get past regionals and you start, uh, you know, you get, you, you, you get done with beating everybody in your state, then all of a sudden you start traveling a little bit. But it still wasn't as taxing on the parents. You still did a lot of that work. You still did a lot of that work in your backyard, right? Fewer games, more practices. See, with fewer games, we don't have to pay as much money for admission fees and tournament fees. So because of that, now we can spend more time in the gym and see if there's fewer teams. That means there's more gym space available. If we don't have to go play a game every weekend and spend all this money on games, then we can spend more money on gym rentals. So maybe we can't get into the high school because, again, the high school coach was probably affiliated with the AAU thing, all right, on some level, right? So they can always use the school. But if that's not if that's not available, then because we have fewer games, right, and we have fewer teams and gym space isn't as a, at, at a premium, then we could always take that money for the team, for team fees, and now we can spend we can spend it on getting into the gym three days a week, or come up with some sort of some sort of situation or operation where kids are able to get into the gym and work on their craft. So now we're not playing as many games, but we're working on our craft. So now when it's time for you to play a game, you're super excited. And oh, by the way, you wasn't six games in a, in, in, in in two days. It wasn't six games in two days. It might be a couple games. It might be a game, right? You get really excited because instead of playing six games or playing three games or four games in two days, you know you've been working really hard all week so you can play that one game. Now when you play, you're not jaded by competition. You're not jaded by, by the game itself. You're excited to play the game because you just got done working. And you work, if, when you work more and you get fewer opportunities to showcase your talents, then when you get a chance to showcase your talents, you're that much more enthusiastic about playing. So when you got a chance to compete, you want to win. You want to compete. But now this group, they play so many games that by that 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 if they lose a game, it's like so what, man? We got another one coming up in a little bit. We got another one coming up in an hour. How about this? We just we just lost this game. We're about to play another game right now. So now all of a sudden, you can't even you can't even develop any emotional intelligence. You can't even play around with your emotions because you don't get a chance to because you're always playing. You don't even get a chance to sit with did I do this right? Did I do this wrong? Could I have done this better? So on and so forth. You're just playing all the time. And that sounds cool, but there's got to be some opportunity for you to, 
kind of deal with losses and wins and so you can kind of establish, you know, some competitive spirit, right? Or sustain it. But again, we have, we have more practices. So more practices means more opportunity to get better, more structured situations to help you work on your craft, work on your game. You know, you when you in practices, only coach puts you in and put you in this situation and say, okay, you can only, you can you can either run this play or that play. You can run this option or that option. You can either do move or this move. Now you're forced to figure out how can this this is what we've been working on, right? In our breakdowns and our breakdown drills. Now I coach said I can only use one or two options to get my shot off or to get the to 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 to, to make my team better. That's how you learn how to turn, take a concept and 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 master it and internalize it. So now you can use it for game sake. But if all you're doing is playing games, you're in survival mode. And that's very few people that can say, okay, I worked on this. I'm going to work on it and join the game. All right? Because if you start doing that, you better, it better work. Or you better have a great relationship with your coach. But if some kids start trying to work on their game during the game, it might be catastrophic and they might end themselves on the, on the bench. But you can do that in practice. You can do that in practice. And as long as you and the coach have a relationship and are understanding that, listen, we've been working on this. So now I need you to exercise this under some pressure in a structured environment where th- th- there's, there's some com- it's competitive, but there's still some structure so that um, it, it helps the developmental process. More practices. You have better coaches. A lot, of, a lot of the coaches back in the day that were involved were probably high school coaches. And so because you were a high school coach, you were involved in high school, those people understood how to teach. And, back, and the coaches back in the day, they, under, they understood how to teach. They understood that there's different levels of people. People learn on different levels. Some people are visual. Some people are audio. Some people are hands on. So when you teach, you have to make sure that the way in which you teach has to impact everybody. Some people can see it and then execute it. Some people got to do it right away and execute it. Some people can just some people can. Um, it's a combination of both. Right. Some people can look at it on a piece of paper. Take look at it on the chalkboard and then go execute it. But some people, if they don't get a chance to move around a little bit and, and, and go set the down screen and then pop and then go cut, if they don't get a chance to kind of do that in some in, in, you know at some time, then it's hard for them to take what they've seen on a, on a chalkboard or what they've seen on a dry erase board or, or iPad. It's hard for them to take that and then go execute it. People learn in different ways. But back in the day, those coaches understood how to teach those kids and the different types of kids with the different types of learning styles. Now, today, you got a bunch of people who may know the game, but can they teach? Teaching is an art and a craft within itself. Don't sleep on the educator who goes to school to learn how to educate multiple learning styles, multiple kids, or multiple, multiple, or very, very, uh, a diverse group of kids. Don't sleep on the educator. If you talk to somebody who's an educator and you talk to them about philosophy as it relates to teaching, you'd be blown away by how deep it is and how much work they put in to make sure that in a class of 20, 25, 30 kids, they can hit or impact the majority of them in different ways. In one setting, in one moment, they can impact a variety of kids. That's what that's what yesterday's coach used to be able to do. I don't know if these coaches today are capable of that. And as I go on, you'll learn that maybe they're not. You get better development. Now I'll give, I'll, I'll give, I'll, I'll, I'll say that there are some incredible skill coaches out there, right? There's some incredible skill coaches out there, but some of these skill coaches now are so concerned with the sexy that they've forgotten about the basics. I watch, I watch trainers train, and I, and I, I've probably done it myself. Right, I've gotten as I've gotten older, I've become a lot more simplistic in my approach. But I see trainers that all they want to do is the three and four drill combinations. Now, I heard that Kyrie Irving, when he handles, he he puts together a, a, a lot of different dribble combinations to see if he can shoot off of it, or pass off of it, or drive off of it. So he might in place, he might set up, make, make give a man his setup. And so while he's when he's setting his defender up or sizing him up, he may give you a combination just to see if he can now accelerate after that after that combination, or can he do a combination of moves, then pull up, do a combination of moves, and then deliver. But this is Kyrie Irving. We're talking about number one. Number two, 
when you're that genius, you got to really flood, you got to really challenge geniuses in a different way. Number two. Number three, the moves are designed, the, the drill combinations are designed for Kyrie Irving, which I'm speaking about, are designed for him to challenge his ability to execute transitions from a dribble move into a productive basketball action. So that how what, what, what's the most complicated dribble combination we can give you and then see if you can transition into a fundamental shot, a fundamental pass, a fundamental blow by move or drive. Right. So th- there's a science to it. He's not just doing it just so he can just just to play around. Stephen Curry, the same way when you see Stephen Curry putting together all those dribble moves, he's trying to say, how, what can I do all these complicated dribble combinations and then collect the ball and rise up for a shot, a dribble, a pass, so on and so forth. Many people train kids that way. They train kids to play that way. Don't get it twisted. At the end of the day, can you blow by this guy? Can you blow by this guy in a straight line? There's a bunch of players in the league. That's how they're getting paid. Yeah, they got they got all of that. You see them in the summer league. You see them in the Drew league. You see them in whatever summer, whatever. You see them at... Um, you know, whatever basketball players play in the summer, you might see them giving a lot of people action, right? Especially if they're a lesser player. But in the, in, the, in the real game, in the playoffs, when you're playing against the Spurs, when you're playing against the Warriors, when it count, when it really count, guys trying to attack you with one 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 hard move, and then maybe maybe give you a counter, and then after that counter, either you trying to score it, you stepping back for a shot, you stepping back so you can create space and pass it, or you dishing off. We ain't got time for you to be dribbling between your legs a gazillion times, especially if that ain't in your game. But that's how a lot of people train. A lot of people train kids to be Kyrie Irving and Stephen Curry. Those guys are special, but those guys are also not very big. So they got to have a little bit more to their game. But if you were, but if you got some size, so you should be able to attack your defender in a straight line. And then when they cut you off, that's when you give them the counter move. So now you got guys developing guys in a way that's more sexy than substance. I feel like coaches turn themselves on. They just they just they just in the gym and they, and they get bored doing the basic stuff. So what they do is they they kind of excite themselves by making this kid do all these crazy dribbling moves and stuff like that. And I see I see it happen even with like young kids, young kids, like a 10, 10, 10, 10 year old, eleven year old. You got this this kid. Let's learn how to hoop. Right, just learn how to hoop, and you throwing the kitchen sink at them, and then they go out there and play, and they can't do their moves. You wondering why it don't work. And part of it is teach them how to teach them how to play with contact. Teach them how to go through somebody's shoulder and then explode to the basket. But let me get off that rant, right? Because that's a development thing, and that's what I do. And then over, and so then what we had, so what we had back in the day, we had a better product. We had a better product, right? Now the game itself, the game itself has evolved. But I don't know if the player has evolved. Now, there is one player that has evolved, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So today's game is all about the money. The game is completely monetized, meaning if you want to play basketball now, you got to pay the money, right? So nobody plays on the hoop court anymore. Nobody plays in the blacktop anymore. Everybody wants to play. Wants to everybody, everybody wants to be a part of a team because everybody's like all the good players are probably playing in a situation that there's money involved. So if we're spending our money, well, then you're going, you, you're going to be in the gym so that we get back the money that we, we get back the, 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 the investment that, you know, we get back something on our investment. So, so you pay, we pay, we pay for you to play on this team. You're not playing on the blacktop. You can do that in your spare time, but at two days a week or whatever, you got to be here in this gym, right? We're not going to waste some money. So now the other kids that may not be playing for a team, there's nobody to play with. So what did they do? Eventually they said, well, I guess I got to go join the team if I want to play basketball because that's the only opportunity I can go play, right? So now it's all about the money. So now you got too many teams now. You got too many teams. So there's no, there's no, there's no like, you know, privilege or there's no um, pride in like making a team or making the team. You can just play to play. You go, you, you can go, you could be, you could be terrible, I see kids that are absolutely terrible. Like, they, they can't play dead. They're on somebody's team because they pay the money. And what people don't know is a lot of times if your kid is terrible, you probably be playing for the kid who is actually pretty good. That kid, isn't playing, that kid probably isn't playing anything 
you paying for him. You paying for your kid and that kid. Right? They scholarship that kid. That's cool, but you probably paying for him. So your kid can't play, but you want this team so that this kid can be a, this this other kid over here can can play. You also have you play too many games. Kids are jaded by competition. They're jaded by competition. They don't, they don't care about wins. They don't care about wins. That's why that's why you can have somebody like like Lonzo Ball play his last game in UCLA, hit the podium, and without any emotion whatsoever, be like, okay, I'm um, so on to the next one. That's why you gotta love um Monk and Fox from Kentucky. Man, it was boohooing on the stage. They cared. Now again, it's a one and done thing. They went to Kentucky because they that's what you do at Kentucky. But they cared. They cared about winning. They cared about this being over. But somebody like Alonzo Ball gets up on the stage and it's like, okay, whatever, man. Uh, next, we're going to the NBA next, so uh, whatever. It's because at some point, man, when you play so many games, you lose some of that emotional that emotional energy. You use some of the emotional connect. Now it's just like, dude, we just played games, man. So what, bro? We lost. And what? So we just play tomorrow. We play in, we can play in two hours. So now you don't have that passion anymore. You don't have that passion anymore, that hunger. And also, with too many games, you develop the instincts. The instincts are incredible these days. The instincts, they're incredible. The reason why you got these guys doing such incredible things with the ball in terms of scoring, the instincts are off the chain. But the habits, the, the habits are poor. The habits are poor. And when we talk about games, the games benefit the point guard. That's why you have such a huge influx of point guard talent in the NBA. Because the game, AAU, it... it, 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 it if you are a ball handling player, if you can dribble the basketball, the game benefits you. The AAU game benefits you. If you are, if you have any shot whatsoever, the game kind of benefits you. Because now they're going to put you in a position where you can space out the floor. They're going to let this guy dribble, 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 pick and roll, dribble, dribble, dribble. And then you can either catch and shoot. And then you can develop this ability to be a good catch and shoot shooter. Right? The big game does not benefit the big. It takes time to develop a bit. It takes time. most people see the game. See they see the they see the game looking at the rim. If you are a big, you probably see the game not looking at the rim, meaning your back is to the basket. It takes time to develop that feel for whenever I turn, I need to be in scoring position. It's a different feel when you get a chance to shoot a floater when you can see the rim. It's a different feel when your back's to the basket and now you got to turn. Get your body not all the way square because if you get all the way square, you're going to get a shot block. So you got to shoot over your shoulder. That's a different feel. That's why people can't master the sky hook because it takes too long. You don't even want to try it. It takes too long. The feel, the repetition, it takes too long. You almost got to start that when you like, I don't when you super, super young, when you're in a single digit age. And people don't want to do that. So everything is now about can you catch a lob? Can you catch the ball at all? Because you can catch the ball, you can possibly catch, get rebounds, you can catch a lob, you can catch a dump off, and then can you, can you finish? DeAndre Jordan, I like DeAndre Jordan, but he's a premier big. You can't throw it to him in a pulse. He has no pulse game. He's, he's starting to shoot his free throws a little bit better, right? But, pre, but he's, he's a premier big. He's nothing like Olajuwon. He's nothing like uh, uh, David Robinson. He's nothing like Tim Duncan. He's nothing like Shaq. He's nothing like Patrick Ewing. He's he's nothing. Shoot, he's nothing like Demarcus Cousins, but he's still a premier big. And you can't throw it to the you can't throw it to him in the post. He's nothing like Dwight Howard, but he's a premier big. Can't Cap- Cap- uh, Capella, same thing. You can, I don't I don't know if you can throw it to him, and I don't know if he can make a move and get you ten points a game off of just throw it down there, make a move on a one on one coverage. But when you were big back in the day, that was a prerequisite. You had to have your you had to have your package, but you don't have to have that now. So the AU game doesn't benefit that kid, but it does benefit the guard. That's why you can't. That's why you can't press guards anymore. Look at Division One teams. Look how many teams Division One ball clubs actually press. You can't press these guards. I Man, they'll cut that thing up in a heartbeat. Why? Because they just got done playing for the last five years of their life, the last six years, or even you talk to some kids ever since they were age nine or 10, they've been breaking down full core presses, right? 
You can't pass it. You can't pass it because you're not strong enough. But you can dribble it. You can dribble through it. Most kids can't catch, right? So what do you end up doing? You learn how to handle. You learn how to pat it. And if a kid's got the, in, the instincts and the courage, then that kid's probably going to be doing that for the rest of his life. So now, when you talk about being able to handle, that's nothing. Kids can do that. That's nothing. And that's why you see in the NBA, there's this huge impact, there's this huge influx of guard talent. Because that's the, that's the spot that's being improved upon and developed the most. But the two guard isn't. Now you're a 3 and D guy. Now you're a 3 and D guy. Right? <laughs> and it's funny, they, they put D in there like that's a premium. You're supposed to be able to play defense anyway. It's the same thing with the two-way player. Oh, he's a two-way player. You're supposed to be able to play deep. You're supposed to be a two-way player no matter who. If, you, if you're hooping, you're automatically a two-way player. The premium is on the offense. Can you score? But you should be able to D your man up and help and help, help, help defend and then help the helper. That should be automatic. That's the automatic thing. The fact that you can shoot a three, the fact that you can score the ball, that's when it becomes like that's a premium. So the AAU game, it, 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 it increases instincts because you're playing so much, right? But people become underdeveloped because now the, pra- the game has taken place of the actual practice. Poor coach. <laughs> Where are we getting these coaches from? What's the credentials? None. Cats don't even have credentials. I know some cats, man, they didn't even play high school ball. But they're coaching. Have no clue how to teach young people. Have no background, no nothing. But they're coaching. Why? Because they got a couple parents to spend some money. They were good salesmen, and they got a ch- and, they, and, they, and they, they got everybody to buy into this idea that if you play with me, we're gonna go travel and we're gonna go see, or we're gonna go play all over the place. So come, so come play with me. And parents are like, well, you know what? My kid's not playing over here. My kid's not playing over here. This seems local. This seems this seems like it's right in my backyard. Fine. My kids can't play anywhere else, so I might as well play with you. If you got a little bit of organization, you got a decent communication, you can finally figure out what the competition is, then you can play. Are they learning? Are they developing? Are they growing? Are we creating a, a foundation for long-term success? That's questionable. But we got a team, so let's play. Coach, what's your credentials? I have none. Cool. But can you get but but you gonna but but you're gonna give my team a full slate of games for the summer. Absolutely. All right, let's rock and roll. And because of that, I think we got a poor product in AAU basketball. I think it's a poor product. And if it was so good, why are these kids competing so hard with European, with the European, the European players? If our if our product in A, if our product was so good, why are we competing so hard with the European players? All the basketball is supposed to be over here. All the good basketball is supposed to be over here. But now, and where it once was like a few European players, now it's probably 50-50 now. It's probably 50-50. When you talk about American players versus European players, it's probably 50-50. So now how does it impact the NBA? How does the AAU game impact the NBA? I might sound a little redundant, but I'm going to try my best to make sure that I don't say things, I don't beat a dead horse. Players aren't as ready as they appear. Players may appear ready, but they're not as ready as they appear. They come into the league young, so a lot of kids are one and done, right? A lot of kids are one and done, especially from America, they're one and done. So you can't tell me in 30 games you got so much better that you're not ready to contribute. You're not ready to contribute to an NBA team. We can we can we can look at we can look at the last five years. Look at all the lottery picks. Look at all lottery picks, right? And tell me and tell me how they've impacted their team in year one, two, and three. Sometimes three, four, and five. The Orlando Magic have been picking out a lottery for I don't know how long. They're terrible. Sacramento have been picking out a lottery for, the, I don't know, for I don't know how long. They're terrible. Phoenix Suns, same thing. They're terrible. There's a bunch of teams that have been picking out a lottery for a long time, and they're terrible. They're terrible. Because a lot of times those guys aren't really ready to play. But they're putting the but but the but the G- M- NBA execs are like, well, we gotta do we let this guy go and let him go somewhere else, or do we just scoop him up and hope that it work out? Oh, let's hope, scoop him up and hope that it works out. But a lot of these kids just aren't ready. The standards have been reduced. Three and D guys, 
three and D guys are like your two guards now. The two guard is really gone. Now you got like a combo guard. You got two combo guards. So now you got somebody like James Harden who comes in the league as a one, as a two. If he can dribble a little bit, now he becomes like a combo guard, right? But you're like the, your two, your your two and three dribble two guard is kind of he's kind of faded. He's become a three and D guy. So now it's like a point guard in two wings. Do you have somebody in your team that can shoot a three? Do you have somebody in your team that can D up? And if you get real lucky, if you get somebody who can put the ball in the deck a couple of times and like create their own shot, like a two, like a classic two guard would be somebody like Brad Bill. Brad Bill is a throwback because back in the day, if you was a two guard, you, 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 your emphasis was on scoring, but you could still handle it. You should be able to handle it enough to put the ball in the deck and run the offense if necessary. When Joe Dumars played with Isaiah Thomas, when Isaiah Thomas got out, got out the game, they bumped Joe Dumars down to the one. Michael Jordan, 89-90, played the one. He played the one. He had a lot of, he had a lot of assists, a lot of triple doubles because he played the one. Your two guards should have been able to put the ball in the deck well enough to get the team in their offense, but you had some guards who were better than that than others. Just like the two guard should be better than the point guard at scoring. Now, I know it's a little bit different now. It's a little bit different. You now need your point guard to facilitate, distribute, and now you need him to score. If you got a point guard who can't score, you're in trouble, right? But, but... That's the way the game has evolved. But now your two guard today, your two guard today has been demoted to a guy, can he shoot and can he defend? And then you're lucky if he can put the ball in the deck twice after the shot fake and see if he can get to the basket and put the ball in the hole. So you see that the, the standards have been reduced. You're big. You're big. You, you, you're this big and you have no post moves. You big and you got zero range in your shot. You have no touch away from the basket. You have no touch 15 feet. Listen, man, if you dribble drive and the guy go and the guy is not going all the way to the paint. I mean, if you, got, if you dribble drive and the big is at the paint and you go to the you go to the hole and that guy can't extend 17 to 15 feet and hit a jump shot. Come on, man. You get paid a lot of money to get better. Now, somebody like Demarcus Cousins, he's going all the way out. Nurkic, Jokic, those guys, they can go all the way out to the three point line. All right, but on some level, you should be able to hit. Think any, you should be able to hit shots 15, 17 feet from the basket. That still, that still allows for the spacing to be. Even if your guy's not going all the way up to the three, three ball, you should still be able to hit that shot, especially if the lob or dunk is unavailable. Right, but the standards have been reduced. The standards have been reduced. Top tier players can't play without the basketball. That's another. That that goes to the fact that some of these players aren't ready. The reason why Michael Jordan was able to come into the league, and I know I shouldn't be talking about Michael Jordan because he's an outlier, but the reason why Michael Jordan was able to come to the league and score 28 points a game is because in college, you don't how to play without the basketball. See, these college coaches now, if you get a, t- a top-tier player, you got you to gotta, you gotta, you gotta ask the question, if I coach this guy like I'm supposed to, if I really coach this guy, is he going to get mad and will it impact how I'm able to get other guys, other top-tier players to come to my program? Now, some people like Coach K, they can get away with it because they got the pedigree, right? So there's some coaches out there that, play, that coach college basketball. They got the pedigree. They got the reputation. They got the success. They get it, all right? Nobody's coming for Coach K's job. But let's say, for instance, you're at a school that get, you, 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 you're on TV, right? Some of these coaches, they don't have the pedigree, but they, they, they have the resume, but they don't have the, the reputation that, it's, that, 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 will, that they can really come in, that a kid can come on their campus and they can kind of tell them what time it is and that kid responds. Because if that kid has a bad time or a bad experience and then they start talking to other recruits, that's going to impact how many, if that kid's able to, if that coach is able to get another recruit down the line. So you got to let that kid play. You got to put the ball in that kid's hand right away. And now you don't get a chance to really coach that kid. Because then that kid's knowing, like, I'm only here for a year, so I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to do my thing for a year. I'm going to let you coach me a little bit, but I'm going to do my thing for this year and then I'm out of here. So now that coach's hands are tied behind his back because he, because he can't really coach him. He's afraid to play his upperclassmen, right? So you got to let that kid play. So you put the ball in his hand. So the emphasis is, what do you do when you have the ball in your hand? Now, here's the thing. When it goes to the league, you got other guys who can play. So now it's hard to take. Now what happens is that kid who's a premier player, he goes to the league and see he gets on the team, but his play doesn't translate into wins. Why? Because he's only good when he's got the ball in his hands. The second you take the ball out of his hands, does he know how to cut? Does he know how to screen? Does he know how to space the floor properly? Does he know how to position himself 
that he 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 takes the the the, the defense away from the action. I see so many times where. And I love Russell Rushbrook, but he doesn't he, he doesn't do it as much now because he's he's playing with better players. But we was playing with Ola Ola Depot. I don't know how many times he would give up the basketball, and if that guy didn't catch and shoot, he run straight to the ball. Instead of letting that guy catch and shoot and drive, now Russell Rush, Russell Rush, Russell Rush, Russell Rushbrook can now become a scorer off the ball. He can become a slasher. He can become a cutter. He can attack closeouts when he catches the basketball. He can become a spot up shooter. Right or just because it's Russell Westbrook, you move. You when it's Russell Westbrook, you got to pick your poison. Do I help or do I let Russ get an open shot? Do I let do I allow this guy to get going or do I stay connected to Russ and now I hope that my man can go one on one? But a lot of these guys, they can only play with the ball in their hand, and so because they can only play with the ball in their hand, they're pretty one dimensional. It's easy to take them away. So if that guy with the ball in his hand is having a bad shooting night and he does nothing off the ball. Then all of a sudden, that guy is easy to take away. And when you get this type of play for three and four years, now you getting you you picking out a lottery, but the lottery isn't helping you because you got a guy who's only good with the ball in his hands. And then the way that the game is evolving, it's high pick and roll with everybody. It's teams like Boston. It's teams like Utah. Um, teams like. Um, Miami, where everybody's touching it, teams like Denver, where everybody's touching it, and so because everybody's touching it, now everybody's a threat. Everybody's a threat, and so in that situation, you 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 can come into a system and come into a program where you learn how to play without the basketball. But a lot of these coaches, a lot of these NBA teams, is high pick and roll. You in this corner, you in this corner, you over here on the wing, big. Come set the pick and roll, and so now. That kid is only allowed to play pick and roll basketball, drive and kick, and then once they get the, get rid of the ball, they have no clue what to do. Watch Stephen Curry, I love it. They run pick and roll with him. He gets to the paint, he drives and kicks, then he goes and relocates, and then that guy's gonna make a decision. His defender has to make a decision: Do I stay with Stephen Curry and go with him because now I just now the paint is a wide open, or do I stay and help? Because if I stay and help, and now that's Clay, Draymond, that's Ingo Dawa, that's KD, now driving to the basket. If I help on this guy going to the basket, Stephen Curry's wide open. So now we see that if you're in a lottery, it doesn't translate to wins. It doesn't translate to wins. Now we're waiting on guys to, to, to evolve in their sixth and seventh year. And I feel like players back in the day used to evolve a little bit different than that. Injuries. Injuries. With all this technology and all the advancements in medicine, Guys are getting injured more than ever, seems like. And it's, it's real simple. They're playing so many games when they're young. They only play one game. They only play one year of high school. They only play one year of college basketball. And then when they get into the pros, their bodies aren't ready. Their bodies, are, their bodies one, aren't ready. Two, their bodies are pretty much, there's a lot of tread on that tire. Back in the day, you practice more. You didn't play six games in one in two weekends. You play one game in a weekend, maybe two games in a weekend. You didn't play six. If you got a really good player and you know he's really, really good, I you're not gonna play that guy. You're gonna play you're gonna play him as long as he can go out there and compete. But then that's the same guy that's now getting drafted in the NBA. And although, and although his body might be strong and so on and so forth. It's only a matter of time before that before the for the mileage catches up. That's why guys from yesteryear were able to play a year, 13, 14 years without a lot of injuries, maybe some knickknack injuries, whatever. But their bodies were strong because they, 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 their bodies were able to mature, and there wasn't so many miles put on that kid when he was a younger kid. And now we're starting to see the effects. Look at the All Star game. How many of these All Stars? Team LeBron had four guys who need to be replaced. Four. And sometimes guys just come down wrong. No contact. They're just coming down wrong. Cause man, they've been they've been they've been and, and now the NBA is saying we need to we need to uh adjust the schedule. Bill Simmons, I love this guy, he's a podcaster. He says, uh, we need to we need to reduce the schedule. we need to reduce the schedule from ten games. Yeah, you probably do. We need to go from 72, 82 games to ten to, to seventy two because you have to compensate for the fact that these kids have probably played so many games in high school that 
again, it's impacting their, their longevity, their ability to stay healthy. You still have your freaks. Giannis is a freak. I'd imagine that Giannis didn't play as much basketball over the, overseas as much as he, he would have played had he been born in America. So his body is strong. His body's going to be fine. You still got your American freaks like LeBron. Le, Le, LeBron's a, in a, he's a freak, but not everybody's built like LeBron. Not everybody's built like Mike. Not everybody's built like Charles Barkley. Nobody's built like some of these guys. But you see somebody like 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 uh, you see somebody like Blake Griffin. He's a specimen. But I guarantee you, he's been playing basketball like nonstop, like crazy, ever since he was probably eight years old. And once he became and once he became of age and started playing on the AU circuit, it got ramped up even more. Now you got a guy who's falling apart, and it's I forget Blake's in his. I can't remember what year he's in. I want to say he's in his seventh or eighth year. Shoot, I can't remember. But Blake should be in his prime. And every every game, every time he every time you play, you're hoping that he doesn't get injured. This shouldn't be happening, man. And every time, and it ain't like he getting injured because he takes taking these he he taking these hard hits. You know what I'm saying? He plays on the ground now. Now you just hope that he doesn't pull his groin, he doesn't pull his arm, he doesn't pull his pec muscle, he doesn't pull his calf, he doesn't pull his hamstring. Worn, these guys get worn out, man. And so I, that's my that's my rant. That's my rant. I like I, I like I, I like the idea of AU basketball. I like the intention, giving kids an opportunity to develop their game, giving them competition, uh, creating opportunities for the best comp, the best players. Um, to come together and for summits and, 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 and you know, giving these kids an opportunity to get seen by colleges and giving kids experiences, you know, being with a team and traveling and things of that nature. It's cool. But I think it's, I think, I think it's, 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 it doesn't, it, pro- it provides a false sense of confidence for the kid. And I think we're starting to see it in the NBA. Players aren't ready as they appear. Players aren't ready. They're talented, but they're not ready. They're talented. They're incredibly skilled, but are they, but do they have the brain trust behind them to understand how to get into a game and in the first in the, in the first two to three years change the trajectory of a program or, or 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 organization or are they able to now be in the game and, and their play translate to wins? How are the standards being reduced? Are we looking at these players and saying, man, these players are, you know, this 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 guy, he's a two and he's a he's a three and D, he's a two way player. You're supposed to be a two way player, but now that's being highlighted. When back in the day, the only way you got highlighted for being a two a, a two way player is if you was Michael Jordan capturing the Defensive Player of the Year in '88. Now you, yeah, he's a premier two way player. No one called Joe Dumars a two way player. He was a, he was a really good he he was only a, he was a really good defender because he could he could slow down Mike. But everybody had to be had that in the bag. Everybody had to have that in the bag. On some level. Now I recognize these guys are playing defense. I get recognized these guys are playing defense at a higher rate because of the spacing, but it still wasn't something that you talked about and gloat and, 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 and gloated over because a guy played defense. You gotta you, sh- you should be playing defense. I guess that's it. I guess that's it. That's my rant. Love to hear what you have to say. Um that's it. That's it. I want to work on some uh, interviews. I want to start interviewing some people. So uh, start interviewing some people, uh, some of my friends, and some ask some interesting friends with some interesting jobs and some interesting takes, interesting takes on things. And uh, and so I'll uh, be in, doing some interviews and uh, kind of changing up the content a little bit and looking to evolve and get better at what I'm doing. So uh, thanks for listening. Uh, greatness lives on the edge of death. I'm not afraid to die. I will fight for my dreams, I will celebrate my dreams, and I will die for my dreams. Thoughts of things and everything starts off as a thought first. It springs from a place of mindfulness and clarity. My name is Mar Fox Jr. I don't know how I feel about AU basketball. <laughs> and I am done. You guys take care.